All right, well, now we're going to talk at length about different aspects of the market revolution, which is something that maybe you've never heard of, but it's one of the most important aspects of U.S. history. And it ushered in such huge changes, fundamental changes, not just in how things were done so far as uh, industry and economics, but culture and just how people live their daily lives and even how people thought. So there's two aspects to the market revolution. Number one, it was a transition from a subsistence economy, uh, which uh, I talked about uh, in the, uh, the previous lecture, which is to say that the small independent farms in the early United States were mostly family farms that produced just enough to feed their family with maybe a little bit extra that they would trade with their neighbors. It was a transition from that to a commercial economy. Now there had been aspects of commercial economy in the uh, U.S. and even in the colonies, but it had never been as widespread as it was going to become in the uh, first half of the 19th century. As a result of, this is the second aspect, two things coming together. Improved transportation and improved technology, which those two are closely connected, of course, because the improved transportation was itself a form of improved technology. Another way of looking at it, maybe an easier way, is the market revolution is what you get when you combine the industrial revolution with the transportation revolution. And this is something that was uniquely American. Uh, the Industrial Revolution started in Europe and had profound, profound effects, some of them very similar to what we're going to talk about culturally. But um, the transportation part was not as important because those European countries were very, very small compared to the United States, especially considering the fact around the time that this gets going, the U.S. had increased in size. So transportation is really going to be the key. And there are several different types of transportation that we're going to look at that drew the country closer together. Roads, and we'll go into some detail about that right here, uh, as well as coming up after we talk, uh, talk about roads, steamboats, canals, railroads, and this may sound strange, the telegraph, which is not a form of transportation, it's a form of communication. But like those forms of transportation, the telegraph drew people closer together. It made distance less of an obstacle and less important. So let's first look at the roads. Um, most roads in the United States, once you got outside of uh, the major cities, uh, that had streets once you uh, got out into the countryside. Most roads were uh, blazed over old Indian roads or trails. They were, uh, they were dirt roads. And this was true all throughout the 1700s until the uh, first turnpike was built in the U.S. in 1795 uh, from Lancaster to Philadelphia, which isn't a great distance. Uh, and that was paved with stones. Now, um, in the early part of the 19th century, around the time, well, right after, right after the uh, War of 1812, which ended in 1815, the U.S. started to turn its attention toward infrastructure of uh, the American system uh, that was championed by Henry Clay uh, was, was part of this. There was a national road built that basically led uh, from those uh, Atlantic states out into the Midwest. So it was a, a road you could travel to, to get out there. And then a few years later, this guy uh, up there in the upper right becomes important. Now he was from Scotland. He lived in Scotland. He wasn't American himself. Um, create, his name was John McAdams. And he created a new type of road that was going to be revolutionary. It was called macadamized roads. And here you can see a, a picture of a macadamized road being built in which basically they 
they lay this uh, sort of boundary at the edge of the road, the edge of the dirt road, and then they start covering it with rocks, but not great big huge pieces of slate. McAdams, what was revolutionary about him and his, his road was he figured out a bunch of little tiny rocks give you better traction than great big rocks, which can be kind of slick, right? So essentially, gravel roads is what we're talking about. Gravel roads made all the difference because once they had these, then you could travel these roads in the winter. You could travel these roads when it was raining. Now, those uh, turnpikes that I was talking about, you could travel them better than you could travel a dirt road, but you still didn't get the kind of traction you were now able to get with a macadamized road. All right. Well, most uh, long distance travel still was done not by land, not by the roads, but on rivers. And you were kind of limited in your ability to travel on a river because for the most part this traveling was done on rafts um, or canoes but you really can't carry much on a canoe so uh, rafts to carry uh, to carry goods downstream and that's the only direction you could go is downstream following the river um, you couldn't turn around and go back upstream well why can't you just row you might say well you try rowing a great big raft upstream for for very far and and see how far you get it just wasn't practical to even uh, attempt to do that so uh, in the early days of the United States there was a lot of raft travel along the rivers particularly the Mississippi River um, once the Louisiana Louisiana Purchase was made so a couple of different types of, of boats that essentially were uh, at least uh, the flat boat was essentially a, a raft um, that had like a little building on it so that you could put stuff in and keep it dry and uh, keel boats which had kind of the uh, the curved pointed prow uh, on, on both sides that made it travel through the water uh, faster and more efficiently now you'll notice there's oars on there what's the deal you just told me that you can't um, row up river well those oars aren't for uh, for rowing up river they are mainly for pushing off from the river bank and you can see in the picture on the left those guys in the keel boat that's what they're doing they're pushing off well um, let's just uh, well let's look at an example where you've got um, kind of the primitive roads that they had at the time and river travel kind of worked hand in hand. Uh, the Natchez Road, also called the Natchez Trace, uh, which uh, was a road that led uh, essentially from Nashville down to uh, uh, Natchez, uh, Mississippi. So let's just say that you were a farmer, oh, let's say in Hendersonville, somewhere close to Nashville, and you have some goods that you want to sell at the best market. And the best market are, are the ones down uh, downstream, downriver on the Mississippi, uh, such as in Natchez. So what you would do is you would load up your stuff on wagons, probably, and you would head west to Memphis. And once you got to Memphis, you would buy a raft and maybe hire a crew if you didn't have enough people working for you um, a flat boat or a keel boat and then you would float down the Mississippi River until you reached your destination in Natchez once you got there um, your raft is now worthless uh, because you can't get it back up the river again so um, probably you're gonna sell that for firewood or something and then you're going to unload your goods, take them to market, and sell them. And this is a very busy market, so you probably are going to sell them. And then you got to get back home to Nashville, and you can't go up the river. Uh, what you're going to have to do is walk, essentially. 
um, walk or maybe buy a buy a horse or a wagon or whatever but you got to travel by land uh, northeast along that road to get back to Nashville now each one of these little dots is called a stand and that essentially a stand was uh, an inn slash tavern a place you could stop uh, and buy a meal buy some drinks uh, maybe uh, stay overnight kind of like a kind of like a motel with a bar attached now this whole process is dangerous because as you're walking up that road there might be enterprising entrepreneurial people who want to uh, uh, engage in some basic capitalism uh, by robbing you uh, because they know anyone walking north on that road is coming from Natchez and they've probably got money, right? So you were kind of taking your life in your own hands. There were a lot of murders along that road and at these various stands. In fact, um, you're taking your life in your hands the whole, the whole process because even when you were uh, floating down the Mississippi River on that raft, you might run into river pirates who uh, uh, would uh, try to board your craft and get you off of it, uh, which might, uh, might include uh, killing you, so that they can get your material, your goods, and take them down and sell them themselves, right? So coming and going, you're in danger. So uh, that's why this uh, Natchez Road or Natchez Trace was also sometimes called the Devil's Backbone. Here we have a, uh, a cartoonized uh, representation of a historical person, Mike Fink, who was uh, the captain of a group of those riverboat pirates known as Mike Fink, King of the River. And he became a larger-than-life character as he's represented here in this caricature. And we'll actually be talking more about him in just a moment. But all that changed with the advent of the steamboat, a boat powered by a steam engine, often uh, an engine that was fed with, uh, with coal to keep the fire burning to produce the steam. Uh, that was important because a steam-powered boat could travel downriver, then turn right around and travel back upriver. And that opened up all kinds of opportunities. The first steamboat, uh, created by Robert Fulton, created and captained the Clermont, navigated the Hudson River in New York in 1807. Four years later, the first steamboat plied its way onto the Mississippi River, and by 20 years later, there were 200 of them operating regularly on the Mississippi. Now, there were lots of advantages to a steamboat. Like I said, you can, you're not limited. You can go up, you can go back, uh, you can go down, you can come back up against the current. Uh, one of the uh, disadvantages was kind of an unfortunate tendency to uh, blow up if the, uh, if the boilers got overheated. You know, you've got to let off a little steam uh, or you'll, you'll blow your top. And that happened from time to time. In fact, I saw... Uh, saw a report in a Cincinnati newspaper about a steamboat that had exploded on the Ohio River and that uh, they said that body parts were raining down like a quarter of a mile, half a mile away. So that'll ruin your day. But it was still, it was still considered to be worth the risk by people who wanted to ship their goods, uh, particularly if they were people wealthy enough to hire somebody else to travel uh, on the boat with the goods. Okay, things get opened up even more after the War of 1812 when New York State invests in a canal, the Erie Canal, that uh, connects ultimately the, all these different rivers to the Great Lakes. 
It was finished in 1825, 363 miles long. Now think about this for a moment, what this means, especially now that there are steamboats, is if you've got goods you want to ship somewhere, you can be in Boston or Philadelphia and you can travel up the river. Then you can travel west on one of these rivers, get to the Great Lakes, and get up there into that Ohio country. Um, and that's something that you would have had to have uh, taken a boat partway, then unloaded it, put it on a wagon, and so on and so forth. This is also revolutionary. By 1837, um, there were 3,000 miles of canals in the United States, most of them in the north. All right, well, uh, another big uh, revolutionary invention was the railroad. Trains, not invented in the U.S. I think they were invented in England, but introduced to the United States in 1828 with the Baltimore and Ohio, which was the first commercial railroad in the United States. By 1860, there were 30,000 miles of railroads in the United States, most of them also in the North. And this uh, not only opened up travel, but it also opened up various types of industry, especially iron and steel production and coal mining. Because, for one thing, the, rail, the, the train's also driven by a steam engine, a boiler that has to be, you know, uh, fed with coal. Uh, also, a lot of iron and steel for making these trains and also for making the railroad ties. Enough railroad ties to cover 30,000 miles. So, um, all of those industries get uh, significantly spurred on. And finally, that non-transportation item, the telegraph developed by Samuel Morse in the 1830s, put into commercial use in 1844, which kind of like sealed the deal, uh, pulling everything together. If you're not familiar with what a telegraph is, why it's this device you see on the upper left in which the operator taps out a message in Morse code, uh, surprise, and it travels along the wires, just like telephone wires, and can immediately be picked up on the other end by an operator who also knows Morse code. So you can send messages practically instantaneously, great distances. Now, uh, imagine how helpful that would have been at various points in American history when huge, huge blunders were committed because people hadn't gotten the news of recent developments in time. All right, well, Here's a guy that we've talked about, uh, we have talked about, and we will talk about um, in, uh, in other contexts. Eli Whitney, whose inventions first of the interchangeable musket parts and then the cotton gin, were actually right there at the beginning stages of the Industrial Revolution in the United States. And I go into much more detail elsewhere about the cotton industry in the South, but uh, I'm showing you this to... Uh, uh, to inform you that, yes, indeed, the cotton industry, because of this technology, dominated the South, but there were some agricultural advancements made in the North as well where wheat was concerned, uh, including a couple of important inventions in the 1830s, the steel plow invented by good old John Deere and the mechanical reaper invented by Cyrus McCormick. This is going to lead to a lot more wheat being produced. Now, I think earlier I talked about how uh, right around the time of the War of 1812 and right after, there were huge markets opened up in Europe for American wheat because of the devastation of the Napoleonic Wars. Well, here we are 20, 25 years down the line, and you've got more mechanical technological advances that make it possible to grow more wheat. So, uh, let's take a look at the United States in the early 1800s. There's that huge Louisiana territory that uh, Jefferson bought from Napoleon. 
in the 1800s, right before the market revolution started, uh, just started to take off, the center for production of wheat in the United States was this region right around here, um, just north of Washington, D.C., uh, Pennsylvania, uh, Maryland, and northern part of Virginia. Uh, a lot of it right there, uh, sort of in the upper right-hand part of that circle in Lancaster, which was in Pennsylvania Dutch territory. But, you know, with the uh, purchase of the territory, the Louisiana Territory, and all these transportation advances, agriculture started moving west, just like people were moving west. Also, uh, I have to bear in mind that this is the Industrial Revolution, right? So uh, factories are starting to be developed, initially mostly cotton mills, textile mills, but more and more different kinds of uh, factories, iron foundries, for example. Uh, and so more and more people are moving into the cities to work in those factories. And so that leads to a change, kind of a shift in agriculture in the north. Those uh, areas, like the one there uh, centered in Pennsylvania uh, that had been the center of wheat production before, they had provided the, uh, the wheat and a lot of the other crops for much of the Atlantic coast. Well, now that uh, these transportation and technological advances have allowed agriculture, large-scale commercial agriculture, to move westward, then those western farms start supplying the, uh, the, the eastern seaboard and those uh, smaller farms there in the east, uh, they wind up focusing almost exclusively on providing uh, food for the nearest cities to them. So, after the introduction of the steel plow and the mechanical reaper, um, wheat production triples. The market begins to expand. Why does the market begin to expand? Let's think about that for a moment. Now, the uh, the old Northwest. Let's take another look at that. Uh, take another look at that map. Uh, there, the the old Northwest was opened up for settlement. People had been wanting to to settle in that for a long time, um, but. The people who did go and settle there, they were subsistence farmers uh, because there wasn't really an opportunity to to be a commercial farmer because if you're up there in Michigan or somewhere and you're growing, uh, growing crops, it wasn't feasible to think that you would be able to transport them all the way to the Atlantic coast. They'd go bad. Uh, it was too much... Uh, too much work just trying to get there. So what would happen uh, usually um, instead is that uh, a few people would move in the area, make claims to some land, and farm just for their families. But now, now that the trains can reach Ohio and to Michigan Territory, and steamboats can go along and use these canals and get to the Great Lakes, and reach Ohio and Michigan. What that means is not only can individual families move there just to try to, you know, to, to make a living for themselves, business interests can go there um, because it is, now, it is now economically feasible to have large farms and large crops with which you're going to um, be able to sell a lot in markets back at the east and that means that since that's the case more people are also going to be moving out into Ohio and Michigan population is going to increase as well so that's a lot of changes just dependent on that one thing and that leads to the growth of new population centers like the city of Chicago which was little more than a wide space in the road uh, circa 1840, by 20 years after that, was a large city. And by 20 years after that, was a metropolis and one of the biggest cities in America because it was the center of the railroad hub and the meatpacking industry. Now, 
with all these factories going up, there's going to be more changes than just uh, not getting as much sunshine. Uh, one change is that the days of the individual craftsman become limited. Now, this happens to a limited extent in the Industrial Revolution. It happens in a much larger way uh, 40 years or so later in the Second Industrial Revolution starting in the 1870s. But it starts here. So before you had a craftsman, an artisan, let's say for example a cobbler, someone who makes shoes. A master cobbler knows how to make a complete shoe start to finish every step of the way. And uh, if he's a really good cobbler, his shoes are of high quality, they're in demand, they fetch a high price, which makes it worthwhile all the labor he puts into making them by hand, by himself or perhaps with an apprentice whom he is training. But now we've got factories, and when you've got factories, you can have boot factories. And when you've got boot factories, they hadn't really... Uh, they hadn't introduced the assembly line yet. That was going to be in the 1890s. But they had introduced the idea of the production of an item, like a boot, being divided into several smaller tasks requiring less skill. So you don't have to be a master cobbler. Your job might just be to nail the sole of the shoe onto the shoe. Uh, and you can learn that pretty quick. And since you can learn it pretty quick, it's not a valuable skill, so you don't get paid much. Because if you quit tomorrow, they can pretty easily find somebody that they can teach to drive a nail into the heel of a shoe. So that means faster output of boots and shoes and whatever other items are being manufactured. More of them can be made. And when you can make more of something more quickly, then you are increasing the supply. All right. When you increase the supply, you decrease the demand uh, so that the cost of these items goes down because it's not taking as much to make them. Uh, and that's going to lead to e ever cheaper wages for the people working in these factories. Now, if you are an artisan, a craftsman, let's say a, a cobbler or a cabinet maker, and you're still trying to make it, uh, the way you always have by making your your item from start to finish and of the highest quality you're gonna have to be content to sell it for less because you can't compete with the prices of these factory manufactured goods so this is going to lead to workers starting to lose a lot of traction it's also going to uh, to, to lead to more and more things being interconnected, right? Everything's tied together with the trains and with the telegraph and so forth. It's all part of this ever-increasing, ever-expanding economy uh, that includes all these different things playing their part. So if one thing gets out of whack, everything can get out of whack. So... Uh, everything is closely connected together. This requires the use of more resources, so cutting down more trees, mining more coal or precious metals. Uh, as I said, the growth of factories and increased population in the Midwest West, but also changing attitudes. So for one thing, nature is no longer considered organic but rather it has been commodified in a very big way now it's not it's not that agrarian ideal of Thomas Jefferson of whether you can be self-sufficient and therefore happy and content it's how much profit can you make and how can you avoid losing your profit uh, this is going to lead to intense competition the development of what would come to be called the rat race. Now, back in the days of the subsistence economy, one family has a farm, another family has a farm. They're not competing with each other. If anything, they help each other out. Now, that's changed. And there is more and more hope for riches 
and therefore more and more fear of failure. Everything is much higher stakes now. There is no contentment, no agrarian contentment. People begin to feel like, well, the rat race, rats in a maze, but they can also begin to feel like cogs in a machine. Now, here's one side effect of this that probably you never would have thought about. Pocket watches. Pocket watches had been around for a, a good long while, but most people didn't own one. Uh, it was kind of uh, the thing, they were kind of expensive, and they were more likely to be used by wealthy gentlemen, because really they were kind of uh, just kind of a, a marker of your status and your wealth. But now that more people are working in factories and they have to catch the train to get to the factory on time, to clock in on time, all of a sudden time is important. And all of a sudden, almost all men start carrying pocket watches. And the impact of that can be seen today when you buy a pair of blue jeans. Uh, sometimes you'll notice there's this extra little pocket on the right side. That's where your pocket watch goes, even though no one has worn not many people have worn one for like a hundred years because during the days of the subsistence economy and everything was small family farms the whole family worked together on the farm they uh they knew that when the sun came up and you could see outside it's time to go to work and they knew that when it got dark and you couldn't see anymore it's time to come home and that's really all they needed to know and they could kind of work with that so those are some of the fundamental changes that take place. Well, I mentioned the Midwest alias the West of that time getting more populated. Now, uh, here is that West, and it's important to realize that at that time, Kentucky and Tennessee were not considered southern. They were considered western. Well, as the population grows in the west, then the frontier of the west is going to expand farther westward into the Louisiana Territory, west of the Mississippi River. Now, the process that we are talking about, essentially, uh, the market revolution and the social changes, essentially from roughly, roughly 1820 to the mid-1840s. All right, so one significant thing that developed over that time was a big, big emphasis on individualism. All right, the idea of the rugged individual or the individual as sovereign. Now, on the one hand, you may, you may say, well, isn't that really classical liberalism, the rights of the individual? And it is. But recall that, uh, you know, those 18th century uh, revolutionary generation uh, leaned more toward republicanism than liberalism in the sense that they leaned more toward looking at things, although they were protecting the rights of the individual, looking at the greater good, the common good, of the uh, community. But now there is this emphasis on being independent, relying on no one but yourself, to be self-reliant, to have self-determination, to be self-improved, to be self-made, to pull yourself up by your bootstraps, which is an exaggeration, you know, that's impossible to do. That's originally the, the point of that. Uh, that expression. Um, and this is a paradox because this emphasis on individuality is coming at a time when with all these rapid changes and everything now being so closely connected by the market economy, everything is more interdependent than it ever was before. And that may seem like a paradox, but in a way it makes perfect sense because this emphasis on rugged individualism is a reaction against the uh, Industrial Revolution, a reaction against feeling like you're connected to everything, like a cog 
in a machine with no individual autonomy. By golly, you want to demonstrate how much autonomy you have got. And so rags to riches stories became popular during this time. And even with a movement like transcendentalism, which was sort of the New England offshoot of the Romantic movement, espoused by philosophers like Ralph Waldo Emerson and David Thoreau, there was a strong, strong emphasis on the individual, on self-actualization. Uh, and that's a, a weird way that, you know, some uh, New England philosophers could have a lot in common with uh, some of the rough-hewn people uh, heading out onto the frontier. This idea of being self-made. In fact, uh, there was a, uh, a Frenchman who came to America in 1835, Alexis de Tocqueville, um, kind of remin reminiscent of Hector saint jean de Croix coeur except uh, Tocqueville didn't move here. He was actually in the United States for France to examine American prisons. Uh, to uh, look for ways to improve French prisons. But he basically, as he traveled around the country visiting prisons, made it into a travelogue, and he wrote a book called Democracy in America, in which he described this strange new creature called the American to his uh, European countrymen. Um, he pointed out that democracy, with a small d, had become a necessary part of American freedom, if you're not aware, many of the Founding Fathers were very suspicious of small-d democracy because they viewed it as mob rule. But now there's an emphasis on even non-wealthy, non-property-owning people as being individuals. In fact, it was around this time in the 1820s that most of the states uh, well, each of the states in turn removed the requirement that you had to have a certain amount of property to vote. So when the United States was first formed, with all men being created equal, only roughly 6% of people could vote. Only if you were white, male, 21 or over, and owned a certain amount of property. Well, uh, here are some things that de Tocqueville remarked about Americans that I think are still um, still on, on the nose. He said, for example, What is most important for democracy is not that great fortunes should not exist, but that great fortunes should not remain in the same hands. In that way, there are rich men, but they do not form a class. So he was remarking, that Americans don't really seem to mind if somebody gets rich. What they mind is if the same family keeps all the money generation after generation because that's too much like aristocracy, which the United States had broken away from England to escape. Um, he pointed out that whereas most Europeans don't really care that much about money because their class defines them. If you're upper class, if you have a title, it doesn't matter if you have any money or not, really, you are still at the top of the hierarchy. But Americans wanted to make money because in America, money could raise you to that upper hierarchy, which uh, natural uh, aristocracy not existing did not automatically endow you with. In fact, he pointed out that everywhere he went in America, everyone he talked to thought they were going to get rich at some point. They were talking about how they were going to make money and how they were going to make it and how they were going to change their lives, whether it was the bartender or the, uh, the, the stable boy or the chambermaid. He also pointed something out that's uh, important. I want you to remember it a little bit. He said that in America, unlike in Europe, you can't just look at someone and, judging by how they're dressed, determine what social class they're in. In Europe, if you belong to a certain class, then you wear that class's clothes. In America, he observed a lot of poor people spending what little money they had 
on nice clothes so they could look rich. And he noticed a lot of rich people dressing like slobs because they didn't care. That's a, a fundamental difference in Europe at that time. And it also, it also ties in to something else that started to happen, something else that arose kind of parallel with the, uh, the market revolution. And that was the rise of respectability.